Amen. If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the letter of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. The letter of Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 33. Are you men excited about talking about these ladies? You ladies t- excited about talking about these men? Oh, yes. Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> what was that, Ms. Brenda? Oh, you're sitting close now, yeah. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 21 through 33. And we're starting at verse 21. I think most of you all are there. And Paul writes this to the Ephesian church. Submit to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you, particular, so love his own wife, as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for this passage of Scripture, and we thank you for the gift of marriage. And Father, we want to thank you for the gift of love. Father, I pray right now that the very love of Christ Jesus may minister to every heart and mind. God, that you move me out of the way, Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will perform surgery on our hearts and minds, Lord, that we may know the very mind of God this morning regarding marriage and regarding relationships and regarding our own needs. God, that you may be king in every area of our life. And we pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I uh, did a wedding one time that uh, the, the bride, when we were going through marriage counseling, this word kept on popping up. And every time I'd say this word, she'd kind of flinch a little bit. And it was this word, uh, respect. It's in the Bible. And so when the day came of the, of the wedding, she came to me and she said, Pastor, I want you to take that respect thing out of the, out of the service. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, uh, well, that's in the Bible. And I can't change what the Bible says. But I'm pretty sure we talked about what that word meant during marriage counseling. You see, that that word submit and that word respect, we're not talking about bondage or slavery or someone lording over you. What we're talking about is a beautiful relationship between a man and a woman, how God intended, intended it to be. A role of leader and a role of partner. And that is the role of marriage. When God took that bone from Adam and shaped Eve, some men think that that bone he took was the ability for us to read your minds, which I think that might be really true at times, because I wish we could read your minds. But when he took that bone, he took that bone not from the feet that man could tread upon woman. He did not take that bone from the head that woman should rule over man. He took it from the rib, which is closest to where, people? The heart. It's a partnership. Uh, I heard a pastor testify during a, uh, he's given a testimony of a funeral service he did, 
uh, a man who'd been married over 64 years to his wife passed away. And he didn't know the, the couple very well, so he went to the, the wife and said, excuse me, ma'am, I, I would like to know a little bit about your husband. Is there anything that you can tell me about him that I can put in the service? And she looked at him with tears in her eyes, and she said, just one thing, and this is all you need to know. In the 64 years of marriage, he's never hurt my heart once. What a testimony. And that pastor looked at that woman and said, that was a man. That was a godly man. And you're a godly woman. What defines us as men and women? You know, it was certainly gender. Amen. God made us male and female. Amen. Certainly age may have something to do with it. But listen, I've seen plenty of adults. We all act like kids sometimes, don't we? So maybe age doesn't define it. You know, Paul wrote in the Ephesian letter in chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, before he even gets to this part, I want to read you this section out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Listen to what Paul wrote. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you, were want, once you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God created us for what? Good works. We were all at once children of disobedience and wrath. But through Christ, we are made for His good works. You know what makes a, a real man and a real woman? Someone who learns this word, sacrifice. You see, before you learn this word sacrifice, you're going to do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. But you see, through Jesus, we learn what true sacrifice is. See, sacrifice is giving up sometimes what you want. And sacrifice is sometimes placing others' needs above whose? Well, your needs. Matter of fact, when we start off in this passage, before we even get to the marriage roles, Paul puts this tagline in verse 21 that we are to submit to one another in the fear of God. This word submit simply means this, placing someone ahead of yourself. I saw a bumper sticker on a truck one time. And you know what it said? It said, real men love Jesus. Amen. How many of you have ever seen a bumper sticker like that? Real men love Jesus. Listen, I want to add something to that. Real men love like Jesus. They just don't love Jesus. They love like Him. Amen. Listen, this world tells us what men are. And listen, a lot of the thing the world thinks men are is a lie. Real men love like Jesus. You know what real women are most concerned with? Not the outer beauty, but the beautiful woman inside. Full of kindness, purity, and holiness. That's a real woman. Men and women who have understand what this word means, sacrifice, submitting. And listen, marriage is all about submitting to one another's needs and trying to meet each other's needs. And in a lot of marriages today, in a lot of relationships, we, you see people more concerned about their own needs than anyone else's needs, even in that relationship. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12, do unto others as you would what? Have them do unto you. Amen? We call this the what? The golden rule, Right? I mean, it's just a great principle to live by. You treat each other in the way you wish to be treated. You know what? That applies in marriage as well. Marriage is learning how to meet 
the other person's needs. Because we all have needs. Amen? Any of y'all got needs out there? And some of you are like, I'm a need to eat lunch after this. Amen? We got needs, right? But I'm talking about deep needs. Everyone has deep needs. And in marriage, you can meet those needs. Everyone has gaps. And in marriage, you can fill each other's gaps. Now, in marriage, most marriages fail because of unmet needs. And we all, as men and women, all men and women have some root, ground, grounded needs. I'm going to list four. Four for men, 70 for women. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just picking. I might get in trouble this morning, men. I'm going to have you all back me up later. Or actually, the men might want to pummel me after this. But men have four needs, and women have four root needs, and we're going to look at these needs and apply it to Ephesians chapter 5. Because Jesus, he gives us so great instructions regarding how we are to meet each other's needs, people. How many of uh, you are husbands out there? Got some husbands out there? How many wives out there? How many of you future husbands? Any future husbands out there? Future wives, listen, we were created for partnership. And so we need to enhance what we have and to be ready for what God's going to give us. Amen? So we're going to look at uh, the men first. This time we're going to look at the men first. Uh, and, and listen, ladies, just really listen to these needs here because these are four root needs that uh, men, they, they need. These four root needs. And we're going to look at verses uh, 22, 24, and 20, or excuse me, 33 in Ephesians. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about this couple named Abigail and Nabal. Now, Nabal lived during the days of David. He had a lot of land, a lot of things, a lot of uh, herds of animals, and he had a lot of servants. And David, while he was running from Saul, and, and during those days, Saul set up camp on some of Nabal's land. And Saul, excuse me, David's men protected uh, Nabal's herds and his men from wild animals and, and, and maybe the occasional bandits. And so David felt like it, maybe he needed some type of compensation. So he sent some of his servants to talk to the owner of all this. His name's Nabal. And when his servants got there, he's like, hi, we represent uh, David, son of Jesse. And Nabal was like, I don't know this, David. And I don't know this son of Jesse. Y'all get off my land. That's essentially what he said. He was very disrespectful to them. He was very, uh, probably a little bit of explosive anger there. And the servants went away. Well, Nabal's servants heard this. And listen, they know David, son of Jesse. And so they went to the sensible one, Nabal's wife. Amen. And they said, Abigail, Nabal just spoke harshly with David's servants. And we know David. And a matter of fact, they knew well because David's servants went to David and said, Hey, David, uh, they, they told us this. You know what David said? Everybody strap your swords on. We're going to fix this problem. We're going to kill this Nabal and all his servants. That's what David was going to do. So here he is. He's getting all of his, like about 200 guys, and they're going to rush Nabal's place. And while this is happening, you know what Abigail's doing? She's making bread, people. She bakes 200 loaves of bread. What a woman, amen? She gets provisions ready, and she gets all these provisions together, and she goes out and meets David before he gets there with all his men. She bows down before David and apologizes for her husband's words and gives him all the provisions. And David, he was so humbled by this woman's honor and respect for her husband and for himself, he forgave it all. Abigail was a woman who honored and respected her husband, even though he was a foolish man. You know, you ladies, the, the first need of a man is honor and respect. That's the first need. When we feel honored and respected, we feel loved. I mean, Paul begins with wives. He says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And we skip down to verse 33, and it says this, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular, in particular so love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she what? Respects her husband. 
It says, men, love your wives, and women, what? Respect your husbands. Because we feel loved when you respect us. And listen, I've heard this. Well, I'd respect him if he'd what? Respect me. How many of you have ever heard that, right? Well, I'd give him respect if he wouldn't act like this. But you see, men were grounded in this idea of honor and respect, and we feel loved when we're respected. Now, some of you ladies are just like, I just don't know about submitting to my husband like Jesus, uh, like the church does to Jesus. That just sounds insane. What actually Paul is talking about is when you uh, address your husband, you don't call him Lord, all right, or Master. What we're talking about is a partnership built on this communication. Before the church does anything, who should we run it by? Jesus. Amen. We should pray about it. Ladies, before you make any big decisions, who do you think you should run it by? Well, your husband. And that's just showing honor and submission and respect. It's something that should be beautiful. Now listen, this is incredibly challenging for some ladies, okay? And the reason why is a lot of us act like Nabal sometimes. And we're foolish and we'll make mistakes. And so three ladies come out of this uh, mistake. Uh, there's three types of ladies that destroy a man's inner self-confidence. All right, y'all ready for these? You ladies ready for this? There's three types of ladies. The first lady is the constant nag. Uh-oh. Well, on dangerous ground now. Be quick, Chris. You can run out of here very fast. It says in Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a contentious wife are alike. And so there's some, we call it encouragement sometimes, right? You ladies call that encouragement, but it's always encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. You know what? I'm just going to talk about it till you do it, son. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. We call that the, the nag. You husbands never call your wife that. Never do that. Then we have the, the kind insulter. They insult you, but very kindly. This is the person who knows exactly what to say to break you from the inside. This is out of Proverbs 12, verse 4. It says this, A good wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness to the bones. There are some ladies who always talk poorly of their husbands. And they do it so people can hear. And it hurts them. It dis it's disrespect. And it hurts them. They don't feel loved when you do it. And so we got the constant nag, the kind insulter, and then the last one, the bossy lady. I tell you, I'm going to get in trouble today. Don't worry, you guys are going to get hit even harder. I promise. It says in Proverbs 21, verse 19, It is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and fretful wife. <laughs> Brother, I don't think you should have said amen there. <laughs> There's other places that you're going to be able to say amen very loudly. But listen, there, there's much truth to this. And listen, all of this comes from the, the nag, the, the kind insulter, and the bossy lady. All this comes from they want their husbands to do right and to do good. And because they want their husbands to do right and to do good, they can't force them to do right or good. And so what they will do is they will do things like this to make sure that their husbands do right and do good. But listen, you are not his enforcer. You can't enforce him to do anything. Listen, us men, we are so rebellious in heart. We do not like authority at the heart of it. That's why we have problems with authority, and that's why we have problems with our Heavenly Father. We have authority issues. And so when you tell us to do something, sometimes the last thing we'll ever want to do is what you told us to do. You cannot be the enforcer in the relationship you must be the encourager. You must be the partner. You must be the equal to Him. Listen to this. You are not the enforcer. Do you know who the enforcer is? 
not his parents, not your parents, not his best friend. God is the enforcer. And listen, if he is a spiritual man and you want him to do good and do well, and you say, honey, I love you. I just want to let you know, I'm going to pray to God about you. (laughs) There's no higher place you can go, people. There's no higher place. You take your spouse to the throne of God and pray for them. Pray for them. Let the Holy Spirit do its job. Guys, we, our grounded need is honor and respect. Number two for, for guys is sex. We're visual and sexual creatures. We are. That's how God made us. God made us that way so that we would cleave and chase our wives. And that y'all can't do anything to get rid of us. We're just always there by you. We just love you so much. We are, we are made and designed like that. But listen, guys, because we are made and designed like that, the world has places that it exploits this need. Can I get an amen? amen? This world will exploit that weakness and that need in your life if it is not being met first by God and second by your wife. You say, Chris, what do you mean by it first by God? Meaning this, that you've turned all of this over to Him. You were bought with a price. God paid for it with blood. You are not your own. You belong to the Heavenly Father. And then God lets you be a part of a beautiful covenant between your wife. Us men, ladies, we we do need that. It's, it's It's an evident thing in the Bible. It says in the Corinthian letter, read you all something out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says this in verse 2, excuse me, verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. We always want to stop reading there. Listen to this, men. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. It's a partnership. It's a partnership built on commitment and love and trust, and it is bound together by the Holy Spirit. And it's a beautiful thing. Most people look at sex in three lights. Some will look at it as gross. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it with the kids. But listen, that is the worst thing you possibly could do with kids today is not talk about how what a wonderful thing it can be in marriage. So some people look at it as gross. Some people look at it as God. And they worship it. And they pursue it and they'll spend a lot of money for it and give almost their entire lives to obtain it. And at the end, after giving themselves away, they're left with nothing. So some people look at it as gross. Some people look at it as God. But listen, God wants us to look at it as a gift. And it's a gift to be shared in marriage and enjoyed. When I was at Charleston Southern, I was in a worship class. And I had the oldest teacher there. His name was Dr. Wendell Gary. I love that man. He's a beautiful professor and he had this big gray white beard. I hope to achieve one day. He kind of looked like Santa Claus. He did. He had those crystal blue eyes and he was teaching about worship. And and one of the uh, the smart Alex students raised their hands in, in class because Dr. Gary just said, everything we do in life can be considered worship unto the Lord. This little fellow in the back raises his hand. He's like, well, Dr. Gary, when I get married and when I'm having sex with my wife, is that worship? And everybody in the class got really quiet. Dr. Gary just rubbed that beard and said, hmm, yes, and I love to worship. (laughs) (laughs) We all like clapped. We were just like, wow, man, that guy, you know? Everything we do in the flesh affects us spiritually because we are spiritual creatures. And it is something that should be held in high regard. So the Song of Solomon says this three or four times. It says, Do not awaken love until it's so ready. 
Don't awaken love until God says yes. And it has to be in marriage. Ladies, that's a need that men have. Uh, so number one, honor and respect. Number two, sex. Number three, fun and friendship. Listen, us men, we're just big kids. And as we get older, our toys get more expensive and bigger. Now, this, this is a very true thing now. There's a church out of, I believe, North Carolina, maybe one out of Tennessee too. They have a ministry geared towards this, hunting widows. Have you ever heard of these? Hunting widows. That's when about when August hits and the men just disappear into the woods <laughs> until January when deer season is over. And there's these, some of these guys, they're just so about hunting. They're just gone. They love hunting. Because listen, we love hobbies. We, we, we love these things. Some of these wives in this ministry, they're taught to do this. Get involved in your husband's hobbies. Because you know what some of you ladies say? is like, my husband never talks to me. Listen, go and get involved in what he likes to do. Us men, we desire fun and friendship. You know what? When we're having fun and with our friends, you know what we'll start doing? Opening up. I would challenge you ladies to try to get involved in the things your husbands are interested in and build a relationship on that. The last thing that men have a deep-rooted need for is a uh, safe place. And we call this home. Listen, you can have four walls and a roof, but that does not make a home a home. It's just a house. You see, you, what you ladies can do is make it into a home. You know, most of us guys, we be okay with a recliner, or a TV, and a refrigerator in our house, and that's all we need. That's all we need. Soap is optional. Well, that's, that's all. But you ladies, y'all can go into a house and y'all can make it beautiful and y'all can make it a home because y'all not only make it look good, but y'all can place this thing in it called love and tenderness. So that when a man comes home, it's a reward. It's something he looks forward to, to coming back to after a long day of work. He needs a safe place. So those are the four needs of men. Men uh, have a deep need for honor, respect, for sex, for fun and friendship, and support at the home or a safe place. Here's you ladies. Y'all ready for the ladies? You men are ready to hear about the ladies? I don't. Y'all are not excited about this. Here are the four root needs of a, a woman. First one is security. You ladies want to feel secure. Not just safe. You want to feel secure in your relationship with your husband. And women want to feel this. And listen, as men, we have to provide that. Uh, look at verse 25 here, men, in Ephesians. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And what? Gave himself up for her. I can't say how many times I've sat in marriage counseling with people or pre-marriage counseling. And uh, we'll look at that verse, and I was like, what does that verse mean, buddy? And he goes, well, that means that I should be ready to die for my wife. And I was like, are you willing to die for your wife? Yeah, I'd die for her right now. And I was like, well, why don't you do the, uh, take out the trash sometime, man? How about do the dishes sometime? We are all about the big things. We're all about the big things. Oh, yeah, I'd die for her. But what about all the small things that add up to tenderness and that you care for her? What about focusing on those small little things daily that lets her know that you love her and that she has a safe place in your heart and that provides security for her? We men must be providers, protectors, and spiritual leaders that sets up security in their hearts. It also says this in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle of any such kind, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Let me talk to you about this. This does not mean that you take a water hose to your wife, men, okay? This is talking about washing your wife with the Word of God. That means your men who read God's Word, your men who live God's Word, your men who not just say, I love Jesus, but you what? You love like Jesus. And you make them feel safe in the relationship. There are three men that destroy women's security. 
You, you men ready for this? There's three types of men that destroy a woman's security. The first one is the ever-absent man. He's just never there. He's always working, and when he's not working, he's outside doing something. He's ever-absent. The second one is the ever-silent man. He's there, but he's quiet. He never talks about his feelings. He never lets you know what's going on in his heart. And even when he is talking to you, he's not really talking to you. And then the last one is the, the angry man. This is the man who is just set off by the littlest things and will explode in anger. Or it's the reverse where this guy is just always passive aggressive on everything that you talk about. Is the angry man. Men, your, your ladies want to feel safe with you. And some of us need to submit to Jesus. And once we submit to Christ, you know what we'll start having? The image of Christ. And we will learn how to love our wives as Jesus loved the church. And it's through submitting to Christ and His Spirit. That's the first need of a woman. The second need is this, non-sexual affection. Number two for us was what, men? Look at that. They're like, sex. Do you see that? Number two is that. Number two for women is non-sexual affection. That means holding the hand. That means rubbing the back. That means, you know, putting your arm around her, right? Some of you guys got your arm around your lady. That's, that's non-sexual affection. That you're being affectionate towards her. Now listen, sometimes uh, us men, we will uh, come home. And, and listen, we might be that ever-absent man, right? And we come home, and you know what we say? Hey, baby. And you know what that woman's going to say? It's going to sound something like this. Oh, so you want something now. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I haven't talked to you in a week. I haven't seen you. Listen, women want to feel what? Secure. You know what women feel the most securest when they know what you're thinking about, where you are, and who you're with. You know what us men call that? Well, that's being kind of stalkerish. No, it's not. And that's not being paranoid, and that's not being jealous. This is your woman, and she loves you. And listen, ladies, if you're honest, you think about your man every day, amen? You know what? When you ask us what we're thinking about, you know what we say most of the time? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Men, you'll need to change your answers up, man. And here's where this comes into play at, is ladies are about, or excuse me, men are about entitlement. Women are about worthiness. Us men, we think, oh, we're entitled. But women, they ask this question, are you worthy of it? And these two things collide. You see, it said, as we just read in 1 Corinthians, that you are not your own, that she belongs to you and you belong to her. It's a partnership. It's a beautiful friendship. And listen, non-sexual affection is really this. It's treating her as the most intimate friend and not as some object to satisfy your needs. That's how she should be. Your most intimate friend. So, ladies are about security, about non-sexual affection. Number three is open and honest communication. You ladies want us to talk about our feelings some of us are not really good at that. And it's going to take effort, men. But listen, the worst thing you could ever say to a woman, I'm going to tell you what the worst thing you could ever say to a woman is nothing. That's the worst thing you could say to a woman, especially if they're mad at you, if you don't say anything. Silence drives them crazy because they want to know what you're thinking and how you're feeling. And if you don't tell them that, they'll go crazy. Now listen, that's why they do the silent treatment with us. And they don't realize this, but it doesn't matter to us. We're okay with silence. And we'll ask them, how are they doing? And they say, oh, I'm, I'm fine. Or I'm fine. Fine can mean so many different things. Amen. And you know, uh, us, we're just, okay, that's, that's fine. Okay. 
The only thing that will ever fix communication issues is speak in your heart. That's the only thing that will fix it. And you ladies want to feel that you know your husband because you want security and you want to know what they're thinking so that you can feel secure and love. And the last thing that all women want is leadership. Now when I say leadership, I'm talking about a man who leads in romance, he chases you, he tries to catch your attention, a man who leads in the home, a man who leads with the children, they want your opinion on everything. Have you ever heard a conversation like this? Honey, what do you think about? And the guy goes, uh, she wants me to say my opinion again. Or how many of you have ever heard this conversation? So where do you want to eat tonight? I don't know. Well, go ahead and pick somewhere. Anywhere? What about this? No, I don't want to go there. Well, what about this? No, I don't think so. What about here? We went here. Oh, no, no, not that. You remember what happened there. Right? And in our hearts, we're just saying, tell us what you want. But listen, women want you to know what they want. And we're made like that. So we can have amazing conversations just like that. Or maybe it's so we can engage in relationship and partnership on a way deeper level. Because it's a struggle at times. And it's hard at times. But listen, I'm just going to be completely honest with you. Jesus said in John 13, 35, that the world would know my disciples by the love they have for each other. How do you love those closest to you? And you can't get no closer than your spouse and partner. You can't get no closer than that. How do you love them? Because Jesus, uh, real men love like who? Jesus. Before a man or woman can ever learn about love, sacrifice, submission, they first must have to meet and get to know King Jesus. And so if you want your marriage to be healthy and your needs met, you need to meet with this King Jesus daily so that you can meet each other's needs. So that your marriage can be just more than just roommates, more than just friends. Your marriage can be a covenant with the everlasting God to, produ to produce faith and fruit here on this earth. And God did this and it's a mystery. But it's very beautiful when Jesus is king in a marriage. Amen. Would you please stand as we go to Lord in prayer. Father, maybe we be real men and real women of faith. Lord, that you would teach us to put others' needs before ourselves. God, that you would teach us how to invest in each other's hearts. God, us men, we need a lot of help. Lord, may your spirit perform spiritual surgery upon us, Lord. And be with our ladies, Father. Continue to give them hearts that's first for you and then for their husbands. Lord, that we may love you Above all, we pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.